If you want to pass the GED science exam, you need to know what to study. When you have an understanding of what will be on the test, you can study more effectively. In this video, I'll lay out what you need to know about cells and human biology in order to pass the GED science exam. This is the second video in a series where I'm going over what you need to know to pass the GED science exam. In the first video, we reviewed what are called the science practices, or the skills that you need to be able to do well on the GED test. In this video, we'll start covering the science content that appears on the test, or specific information that will be helpful for you to know about so that you can do well. Specifically, in this video, we're going to jump into the life sciences, which make up about 40% of the GED science test. Today we'll start by talking about cells, their structure and function, and then we'll zoom out and we'll talk about the human body and the systems that make it run. Having a better idea of what you'll need to know can help you focus your efforts on the best resources for you. This video will be far from exhaustive, but I hope it will be a good jumping off point for you as you begin your studies. Even though today we're going to be talking about cells and human biology, I want to re-emphasize something that I said in the first video of the series. This test is not about memorization, so they're not going to ask you to list the names of the bones or all the cell organelles or anything like that. Please do not stress too much about trying to get anything memorized. However, as we have discussed before, it's really helpful if you are familiar with the vocabulary that will appear on the test. That way, when you read the passages and you look at the diagrams, you'll have some context that will help you to answer the questions, and you might already be familiar with the topics that the passages contain. Just like we discussed for the social studies test, the GED testing service doesn't disclose very much about what specifically will be on the science test. They emphasize that you should work on the science practices that we discussed in the first video, but they don't give a lot of details about what specific science the passages will be about. What I'll be sharing with you today is adapted from the Kaplan GED prep manual, which I do recommend that you either purchase or borrow from your local library. And I'll put a link in the description if you'd like to check it out. As a GED instructor, I had the opportunity to review and help students study from a lot of the different GED prep manuals, and I'm pretty confident in what I'm going to present to you today. First, let's jump into life sciences with the topic of cells. Cells are the basic unit of life. All living things are made out of cells. The science word for living things is organism, and some organisms are unicellular, that is made out of one cell. This includes organisms like bacteria or protozoa. Other organisms are multicellular, or made up of many cells, like animals and plants. In multicellular organisms, there are a variety of different types of cells that are specialized to do different things. The basic functions of every cell are to grow, reproduce, maintain their structures, and move around. Cells have different components that help them to perform their essential functions. The outside of the cell is called the cell membrane. The cell membrane is a semi-permeable barrier, which allows it to let water and nutrients into the cell and allow waste to get out of the cell, while still protecting the parts of the cell inside. Inside of the cell is a jelly-like substance called cytoplasm. The cytoplasm contains all of the cell's organelles, or separate parts of a cell that each have a special job. All cells contain genetic materials, which contain instructions for performing the cell's activities and for reproducing more copies of the cell. In cells like bacteria called prokaryotes, the genetic materia just floats in the cytoplasm. Other cells called eukaryotes, including plant and animal cells, have an organelle called a nucleus, which houses the genetic material. There are a lot of other specialized parts inside of the cell, but we'll just talk about a few. Mitochondria, you might have heard of, are called the powerhouse of the cell. The mitochondria use carbohydrates to produce energy for the cell to use towards its essential functions. The cell's ribosomes produce proteins, which the cell uses to carry out many of its functions, including maintaining its own structures. Plant cells in particular have some unique parts that differ from animal cells. Plant cells contain an organelle called chloroplasts, which make food for the plant by absorbing energy from the sun's rays. Plant cells also have a cell wall that surrounds the cell membrane. This gives the plant cell more rigidity and helps it to maintain its shape. 
They also contain one large vacuole, which stores water and nutrients for the plant and also helps it to maintain its shape. Instead of one large vacuole, animal cells often have several smaller ones. Next, let's talk about cell processes. All cells carry out their basic functions of life, to grow and to reproduce themselves. In order to do this, they need energy. Cells have a few strategies for obtaining that energy. As I mentioned, plant cells use their chloroplasts to convert the sun's energy into food for the plant by a process called photosynthesis. The chloroplasts contain a green pigment called chlorophyll that traps the sun's light energy. The plant then uses that energy to transform carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. This is the chemical equation for the process of photosynthesis. CO2 is the chemical formula for carbon dioxide. Notice the C stands for one atom of carbon and the O2 indicates two atoms of oxygen or carbon di, which means two, oxide for oxygen. The six indicates that there are six molecules of carbon dioxide required. You might be more familiar with H2O, that's two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen or water. The arrow indicates that when six molecules of carbon dioxide are combined with six molecules of water in the presence of light energy, they rearrange to become one molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen. You should be familiar with this type of notation for the GED test, but you don't have to memorize any chemical equations or formulas. It's worth noticing that in this equation, there are the same number of each element on either side of the arrow. For example, on the left side, there are a total of 18 oxygen atoms. There are six times two, atoms of oxygen in the carbon dioxide molecule and one each in the six molecules of water. On the right side, there are 18 total atoms of oxygen as well, six in the glucose and six times two or 12 in the six diatomic oxygen molecules. So nothing is lost in this transformation. It's just rearranged. All right, so back to photosynthesis. Plant cells use photosynthesis to store energy as glucose and other carbohydrates. Then, when a cell needs energy, it uses a process called cell respiration to access that stored energy. Here's the chemical equation for cell respiration. Some things to notice. This chemical equation takes oxygen and glucose and transforms it into usable energy with byproducts of carbon dioxide and water. This is the opposite of the photosynthesis equation, which took carbon dioxide, water, and energy and transformed it into glucose and oxygen. Organisms like animals that cannot use photosynthesis to produce their own energy eat and digest plants or other organisms that eat plants in order to access the stored energy within the plants. Humans also access the energy that's stored in plants through other methods. For example, by burning trees or fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas to produce light, heat, and electricity. This is a relevant idea when we think about climate change and increasing global temperatures. One of the main causes of climate change is due to an increased concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, mainly due to the burning of fossil fuels, which are basically just really old plants. When we burn those fuels to release the energy, we're also releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is the reason that tree planting is one of the proposed offsets to fossil fuel use. The idea is that more trees would be able to capture more carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis. Now let's zoom out from individual cells and their processes so we can talk about some larger organisms made up of cells. Humans. Human bodies are composed of cells, lots of them. Scientists estimate that the human body is composed of more than 30 trillion human cells. Each cell is specialized to perform a specific job that keeps the body alive. Cells of the same types are organized into groups called tissues. Tissue groups that perform specific jobs like your eyes or your stomach are called organs. Organs work together to perform the body's main functions, 
and those collaborating organs together are called body systems. Like the circulatory, respiratory, digestive, nervous, immune, reproductive, urinary, skeletal, and muscular systems. We'll go over a few of the big ones. But if you're not familiar with each body system and what it does, I do recommend that you spend time learning about each one. It could definitely be useful for you on the GED test, but it's also just important for you as a human to understand how your body works. First, let's talk about the circulatory system. The primary function of the circulatory system is to circulate or move blood throughout the body to deliver oxygen and nutrients to different tissues, and then to remove carbon dioxide and other waste. The main parts of the circulatory system are the heart and the blood vessels. The heart is a big muscle which contracts to move blood around. Blood moves from the heart into larger and then smaller arteries, and finally into tiny capillaries throughout the body. These tiny blood vessels have thin walls that allow oxygen and nutrients nutrients to filter out into other tissues, as well as to absorb carbon dioxide and other waste. Then the blood travels back through the capillaries into small veins and then larger veins and back into the heart. This is where the circulatory system intersects with the respiratory system. The respiratory system consists of the lungs, the trachea, the throat, and the nose. Air enters the body through the nose and travels down the throat into the trachea, which then splits into two passages called bronchi which lead to each lung. These split into even smaller bronchioles throughout the lung, which end in alveoli, which are little air sacs where capillaries, those tiny blood vessels, exchange oxygen from the air with carbon dioxide from the blood. From there, the reoxygenated blood returns to the heart to be pumped throughout the body. So I hope you've noticed that a lot of the processes we've been describing in this entire video are about exchanging oxygen and nutrients for carbon dioxide and waste. The respiratory system is responsible for that carbon dioxide and oxygen, and you can think of the digestive system as being responsible for delivering nutrients to the body and then removing food waste from the body. The digestive system starts in the mouth, where chewing with teeth and saliva start to break down food. From there, food travels through the esophagus into the stomach, where enzymes and stomach acids further digest the food. Next, the small intestine absorbs nutrients from the food into the bloodstream through again those tiny capillaries so that the nutrients can travel to tissues in other parts of the body. Then the large intestine removes water from the food waste and the remaining solid waste is eliminated from the body through the rectum. All of these body processes, and many more, are directed by the nervous system, which receives processes and transmits information to control the body. The nervous system is made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and nerves. There are three main parts of the brain. The cerebrum, which is responsible for seeing, speaking, and thinking. The cerebellum, which is responsible for movement and position. And the brainstem, which regulates breathing, heart rate, digestion, and other involuntary essential processes of life. Information travels from the brain down the spinal cord and throughout the body through nerves. And information travels back to the brain from the body on the same pathways. There are several different factors which can lead to health issues, where body systems are not functioning at peak performance. A big cause of health issues are infections, or invasions of the body by unwanted bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, or worms. These organisms might enter the body through breaks in the skin, through contact with infected blood or saliva, as droplets or particles in the air, as contaminated food or water, or by sexual activity. Some infectious diseases transmit from person to person, while others are transmitted through contact with animals. The human body has many natural defenses against pathogens entering the body, including the skin, mucous membranes, tears, and stomach acid. When pathogens do enter the body, the immune system produces antibodies that can fight infection. We can also protect against infectious disease through sanitation, water and sewage systems, immunizing against certain disease with vaccination, and antibiotics that can kill certain bacteria 
bacteria. Through a combination of these methods, rates of infectious disease have fallen significantly over the past century. However, there are still pathogens for which we do not have vaccinations, and some bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Infectious disease remains much more deadly in communities that lack access to modern sanitation and adequate medical care. Another factor in maintaining healthy, functioning bodies is nutrition. Nutrients are substances that the body needs to grow, function, and maintain its cells. These substances are not produced by the body and must be consumed in the form of food. These include proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. A well-balanced diet provides enough of each of these nutrients, but not too much of any of them. Nutritional imbalance, whether it's too much or or too little of a nutrient can cause a variety of health issues. Other substances that impact the functioning of the body are called drugs. Some drugs can be used to treat disease or to relieve the symptoms of a disease. Other drugs have no medicinal purpose, but may be consumed for their mood-altering properties. Drug abuse is when a substance is used non-medically to the point where it interferes with normal functioning. Some drugs are addictive, like opiates, alcohol, nicotine, and barbiturates. Addictive substances cause changes in the body that can lead to severe dependence on the substance. When use is stopped, the person can experience severe withdrawal symptoms like nausea and pain. Other drugs can cause a lesser dependence called habituation. There are no physical withdrawal symptoms, but the urge to continue usage of the substance may be strong. Some users can become habituated to drugs like marijuana and hallucinogens. Similar to nutrition, safe, appropriate usage of substances under the care of a doctor can lead to improvements in quality of life, while overuse can be dangerous and cause health issues. Okay, so that was a brief overview of cells, their structures and functions, as well as the human body and its systems that you'll need to be familiar with in order to do well on the GED science exam. Of course, there is a lot more to know about both topics. So please consider this video either a quick refresher or as a starting point for more study. I definitely recommend that you take some time with the GED preparation manual to read more in depth about these topics as well as to complete practice questions like the ones that you will see on the GED science test. I always recommend the Kaplan GED prep manual, which I will link below. You could also use any GED prep manual that your library has available to borrow. I also recommend that you use all of the online resources that are available, especially if you're not as familiar with these topics. While there aren't as many GED specific materials, there are great video series about biology both on Crash Course and Khan Academy. Again, you don't need to worry about memorizing anything, but you do want to feel comfortable with these ideas so that you're ready to read and understand diagrams and passages that will appear on the test. On this channel, I make videos about how to study more effectively so that you can achieve your goals. In the coming weeks, I'll be discussing the remaining topics that will appear on the GED science test, including more life science, physical science, and earth and space science. So please do subscribe if you'd like to learn more. If you're just starting to think about studying for the GED exam, you can check out my video about how to begin the process. Or if you're a little deeper in, check out my playlist about how to study for the math exam, the RLA exam, and the social studies exam. If this video has been helpful to you, please press the like button so that YouTube knows that this is a good resource for GED studiers. Your support is what enables me to put time into producing and creating more of these resources for you. So thank you as always for watching, and until next time, happy studying.